Why would a society be so irrational? Because for capitalists, this is no longer the place that matters. This is the place that mattered in the past. I have been at meetings where university officials go to try to convince corporations to endow a chair to give money to the university. And I've sat there and watched the big corporate officials explain to the academic deans and provosts in the room, I'd love to give you a chair, but I, I allocated already this year's chairs. Oh, really? Where? Let's see, Hyderabad, Rio, and um, Tianjin. Well, why would an American corporate because that's where the engineers are that they want, because those are where the engineers are coming that are cheap. They don't want to endow a chair here. They don't need anything here. Or to put it differently, they don't need an engineer. They need a fitness instructor. They need a fast food worker. They need a cleaner upper. They don't need to spend money here. Why? They don't want an engineer from here. They want cheap labor. And Americans are not cheap enough yet. I'm Dan. Now, man, nice wonder. Great speakers open their hearts and open their minds before they open their mouths. Richard Wolff is an economist. He's a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs at the New School University in New York City. He's also a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He's the author of books such as Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. He has a regular column in truthout.org, and he's the host of the radio show Economic Update. He spoke at the Musicians Union in Hollywood on the subject of economic crisis and system decline and what we can do. Ladies and gentlemen, scholars and students, Professor Richard Wolff. Why do they not care about the decline of public education? What are they doing? Because this is not where the work is going to come from. I go to meetings, I le learn about how the United States is now a mature economy. Oh, watch out when that adjective gets thrown at you. <laughs> it's never a good sign. A mature economy means one that isn't growing anymore. So corporations are being advised, focus on the world, the parts of the world that are growing, where your market will expand, where you can participate in growth and therefore see rising profits and do well. And the United States isn't that place. Uh-oh. Then why pay taxes here? To enable the government to, to do what? Work real hard to take care of a population you don't care about it. It's not your future. It's over. We are living in a period of American history that is very strange. We're, it's over, but we are all, even those of us in this room, engaged in a massive, a massive process of denial. Nor is it surprising. <laughs> Nor, nor is it surprising. Who would want to face the implications of what I'm telling you? Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you down. <laughs> Denial is an understandable reaction to a difficult reality. Always has been. You know that from your own personal life. Think about it. So what do you do? 
What do you do, how do you handle a situation like this as a society? Well, you could, you could appeal to the government. And Americans like to do that, despite what they say. The government is called in to fix things, rules, laws, regulations. And I want to hammer home, as I bring this to a close, I want to hammer home the mistake that I think that represents. A mistake I think our history teaches us. The last time our economy faced anything like the crisis we're in now was the 1930s. And as Susie mentioned before, I want to say a few words about that. In the 1930s, we had terrible unemployment. 1933, official unemployment rate 25%, more than three times what we have now. Terrible. No jobs, unemployed people, no taxes flowing into any government. They couldn't do anything because like today, there's no money, there's no money. And the president who was elected, Roosevelt, in 1932, came in as a kind of centrist Democrat. Not that different, if you think about it, from the one we have now. Believed in a balanced budget, all sorts of things. But then within a year, this president really changed. Wow. And by 1933, listen to what this man did. Trying to deal with a crisis like the one we're in now, even before the long term turning away from America had happened. He went on radio, there was no television, and he said, I'm going to create Social Security. Big smile. I'm giving everybody who's 65 years of age or older a check every month for the rest of their, la their lives. Wow. I thought there was no money, the American people said. No, no, he said, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> and no sooner was he done with that speech, he stood up, he gave another speech, and he declared the beginning of unemployment compensation. We'd never had social security in America before. We never had unemployment compensation. Those were created in the depths of a depression. He went on the radio and he said, I'm going to give every unemployed man and woman a check every week for a couple of years just to make it kind of easier for you. It's not your fault. Wow. There were tens of millions of unemployed people. He was now going to give a check to the old ones, 65 and older, and he was going to give a check to all the unemployed, but he wasn't done. Within a few weeks, he went on the radio and he said, I got another plan. It turns out, it strikes me, he said, as unfair to have millions of Americans, all they want to do is have a job, work, go out to work every day, and the private corporations of this country won't provide them with jobs. It seems to me the only reasonable thing for me to do is the government should provide them with jobs. So between 1934, between 1934 and 1941, he created and filled 15 million jobs. Wow. The, the, the stunning reality of American politics today is not that we're not doing that. The achievement of American politics is no one even discusses it. It's as if we've had a kind of attack of national amnesia, an illness of the brain that requires us not to know even a recent part of our own history. Well, you might be wondering, and you should, about where in the world Roosevelt got the money for Social Security, unemployment, and paying salaries to those millions of people he hired. And I'm going to tell you now, you're not going to believe it because you live in a different time, but I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to say it twice to help you believe it. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. It's, it's interesting. We in New York think that what just happened here can't happen in a place called Southern California. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'll take back a report that you had that reaction. So I'll, I'll say it again. He taxed corporations and the rich.
But I, I want, in this history, I want to give you the, the, the details. In 1943 and 44, the President of the United States at that time, and we're in war, that's the Second World War, we're in war at that time, sent the following message to the Congress of the United States. He said, I want an increase in the rate of taxation on the richest American individuals. And then he proposed, and I won't embarrass you by asking how many of you do, did not know what I'm about to tell you. He proposed the following tax rate on the richest people, 100%. No, no, th this is the reality. The rule was to be, here's his proposal, every dollar over 25,000 a year that any American earned, he wouldn't earn. Every dollar over 25,000, the government would take exactly all of it. You know what that's called in the rest of the world? A maximum income. Nobody would earn, by the way, $25,000 then is about $380,000 today, per year. Well, you can imagine when Roosevelt's message got to Congress, the Republicans went ballistic. <laughs> Many of the conservative Democrats, who are only conservative Democrats because they can't spell Republican. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to do that. Um, Many of the conservative Democrats were against it too. There was yelling and screaming and blah, 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 all that. And then a compromise was reached. The Republicans agreed to it, the Democrats agreed to it, they passed the bill and the president signed it. And in 1944, the top income tax bracket on wealthy individuals in America was 94%. The top income tax bracket in the United States today is 39.6%. That's a tax cut from 94 to 39. The middle class in America can't dream of such a tax cut and has never had one. Yes, unless you're Mitt Romney and then you avoid the whole issue by going to a warm island in the ocean. That's different. But it's not just a tax on the rich that paid for all of those services to the poor, social security, unemployment compensation, and public sector jobs. It was also a tax on corporations. So here's one little statistic. If you're a professor of economics like me, you, you live your life with a lot of statistics. Makes it kind of dull, but you know things. <laughs> you know things. In 1945, the federal government, as it does today, relied overwhelmingly on the income tax to get its revenue. Income tax on individuals, your wages, your salary, and income tax on corporations, on their profits. So in 1945, for every dollar that the federal government got by taxing individuals, it got $1.50 by taxing corporations. That is, taken together, corporations gave the government 50% more than individuals did. Today in the United States, for every dollar that we all pay in income tax, corporations pay 25 cents. The last 50 years has seen a shift in the burden of taxation in America. Off of corporations, onto individuals, and off of the richest individuals, onto all of you. So on behalf of America's corporations and wealthy individuals, I want to say to everyone in this room, thank you. <laughs> How kind of you. You all seem to be willing to believe that the issue is high taxes or low taxes. It isn't. The issue is who pays the taxes. They don't. You do. And if you understand that, you'll change the politics. But this is not the reason for the history. The reason for the history is, why did that happen? And what was the mistake they made? Was this Roosevelt who made this happen? Not at all. He just announced it. What made it happen was pressure from below. Let's see what that was. Let's see what it was. First something called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, 
CIO. In the 1930s, we had the greatest union organizing drive in the history of the United States. We never had anything like that before, and we've never had anything like that since. Millions of Americans who had never been in a trade union got together, joined the unions, because they believed it was their best chance to survive the worst depression capitalism had ever seen. Millions joined. We also had a powerful communist party. And we had two powerful socialist parties. And the communist parties and the socialist parties and the CIO, led at that time by the mine workers uh, leader, uh, John L. Lewis, worked together. And they went to Mr. Roosevelt as president, very politely, very politely. And they said, look, Mr. Roosevelt, see, we got these millions and millions of people that we've organized as union, socialist, communist, all that. And you've got to do something for us. Because those of us that are unionists are telling you we're suffering terribly and, and no one's helping us. And those communists over there, they keep saying that if something doesn't happen, then we're going to do in America what those people over in Russia did, and that's scary. And they said that to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was an astute politician. He knew they meant it, because he could see what was going on. They had the millions of people. So he went, he convened a meeting of rich people and corporations. You know, he comes from that background personally. His family is an elite family. And he told them, he basically said to them, look, I got to do something for the mass of people. It's going to cost an enormous amount of money. You're going to give it to me. Because if you don't, you're going to lose it all. So you better give me some, because that's your only hope. Look every day in the street. You see those communists marching down and talking about Russia? Do you want to lose it all? He split them. He didn't win them all over, not by a long shot. He split the corporate leaders, and he split the rich. Half went with him, and half formed the Republican Party backbone. Okay. But the half was enough so he could get those things through. But he demanded something in exchange from the unions, the communists, and the socialists. And the majority of all those groups agreed. I'm going to give you the best help for the mass of people you could imagine. Social security, unemployment, what I went through with you. But you've got to stop talking revolutionary babble. I don't want to hear that anymore. We're not going to do that. No, no, no. Russia, blah, blah. stop all that. If you shut that down, I'll give you social security. I'll give you jobs. I'll give you what you want. That deal was struck. That deal was done. The masses got a program. What's the lesson here? Two lessons. One, you want a different outcome to a period of economic hard times. You've got to build organizations from below. You count on the political structure, you will get exactly nothing. Okay, that's the first lesson. But even more important is the second lesson. If you don't, here we go now, change the organization of the enterprise, if you don't radically alter the capitalist enterprise, everything you do can and will be undone. See, what happened was you left in place the heads of all the corporations. You left in place the organization of the major shareholders, the board of directors, the whole apparatus that we began today with. You left them in place, which meant you left in place the people, the boards of directors and major shareholders, with every incentive to evade these rules and regulations. You put a high tax, we'll go to the Bahamas. You impose a rule, we'll move in a way you can't. We'll go to work to evade whatever rules and regulations you pass. When we're strong enough, we'll go and weaken them. And when we're really strong, we will repeal them. One example, in the midst of the Great Depression, Americans understood, as we have learned again, that one of the causes of a Great Depression is the behavior of the major banks in your society. So angry were Americans in the 1930s, almost as angry as polls suggest they are today, that a bill was passed 
called the Glass-Steagall Act, the Banking Act of 1933 and 34. The details aren't important. It creates a, a, a wall between investment banking and commercial banking so that deposits we all put in the bank cannot be invested in a risky way so we don't get them back. That bill became the law. The minute it became the law, all the big banks, Bank of America, Citibank, Chase Manhattan, all the rest, went to work to evade it. And that took a 25 years of successful evasion. Then they got stronger and weakened it. And then in the 1990s, they were finally strong enough. They got together and they repealed it. And they sent a bill to Congress to eliminate the Glass-Steagall Act. And in 1999, the President of the United States signed the repeal, President Bill Clinton. Okay, he signed the repeal, 1999. Eight years later, economy collapsed and the banks let us into it. What a joke, but the joke's on us. The first time you react to a capitalist crisis by rules and regulations, shame on them for undoing it. But if all we do is react to the next crisis by another set of rule, that is shame on us. We haven't learned anything. <laughs> the, the people who run the corporations of America not only have every incentive to undo the rules and regulations, but they have the money to realize these incentives. They're the ones who get all that surplus. They're the ones who get all the profits. They have the money to hire the economists, like me. The lawyers, the accountants, all the specialists that can work with them to eviscerate the point of the law. And that's what they've done. Here we are in the second biggest crisis. We're not establishing social security, we're cutting it. We're not extending unemployment benefits. We just finished cutting them off. And we don't even discuss a public employment program. Wow. It's all been undone. So here was the mistake. You cannot solve the contradictions, the catastrophes, the crises of capitalism. You cannot undo the abandonment of North America, Western Europe, and Japan in the way I described unless you deal with the organization of the enterprise. Who makes the decisions for what purposes about the daily functioning of an enterprise? If you don't deal with that, then the people who are in charge the major shareholders and the boards of directors will move out of the country, will undo the federal rules and regulations, and keep producing crises the way capitalism always has. Capitalism has been dominant for 250 years. It has never solved economic crisis. Roosevelt made speech after speech at which he said, my policies will not only get us out of the Great Depression, but they will make sure that no future downturn like this will afflict our children. That was a promise he made, but he could not keep. Every president since Roosevelt, including Obama, has promised the same. My policies will get us out of the downturn and will make sure this never happens again. None of them has ever delivered on this promise. They can't, because to deliver on that promise, even though I don't understand it, means to undo the system that presents us with the problem. If you lived in an apartment with a roommate as unstable as capitalism has been, <laughs> you would have moved out long ago, or demanded that your roommate get professional help. <laughs> Why do we accept to live in a system that works this way? Last, last point, solution. The solution is to not leave in, in power, inside the corporation, the system that now exists there, because that was the problem. That was not changed in the Great Depression, so we're back in another one. That was not changed in a way that would prevent our cities being destroyed, our children's education undermined. Stop, we have to do that. What would it mean? The best way to describe it, slogan that I use,
democratize the enterprise. Finally bring to the enterprise the commitment to democracy we're supposed to be committed to in this country. The factories, the offices, and the stores can and should be run collectively and democratically by the people who work there. I, in planning my talk, I presumed you would be, by this time, if I'm any good at this, somewhat persuaded that this is a good idea. But what you would be skeptical about is how to do it, how it would work. So that's what I want to finish with. Can it work? Of course it can work. This is not some idea about a fanciful future utopia. We're talking about democratizing enterprises by doing in the general a typical enterprise, what has already been done in many enterprises around the world. So we know how to do it because we know it's been done and it has succeeded. It has succeeded. Here in California, there are all manner of worker co-ops in the north, in the south, and in the middle. And they're all across the United States and they're all across the world. You don't have to wonder how to do it, just study the way they've managed it. These are your fellow American citizens. Oh well, then the question is, gee, yeah, but that's true. Maybe you know about the Arismendi bakeries up in the Bay Area, some of you, who, who are organized this way, a group of five bakeries around the Bay Area. But these are small enterprises. I get that all the time. These are small. I find this very strange. I could say to all of you, you know, once upon a time, hmm, you were small. <laughs> yeah, but then I grew. So this is not very exciting. Do small companies get larger? I think so. <laughs> For example, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, every capitalist enterprise that emerged in Britain or Europe at the transition was, guess what? Small. <laughs> one capitalist, three workers. One capitalist, six workers. One capitalist, nine workers. Today, General Electric, 200,000 workers. Isn't that marvelous? They went from small to large. Guess what? Worker co-ops, likewise, go from small, which is how they begin, like you, and then they become larger. That concludes our segment with economist Richard Wolff.